on extreme black holes in the JT model. Hmm. Let me see if I can get this pointer going. Ah, here. Okay, uh, well, let's, uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, the title of my talk is Near Extremal Black Holes and the Jakeev Teitelbaum Model. And what I'd like to investigate in this talk and report on is attempts to understand uh, near extremal black holes in higher dimensions, for example, four dimensions or five dimensions, by using the JT model, which is, of course, a two-dimensional model of gravity. And uh, the, the bottom line, uh, which was a bit of a surprise to me from when I first started, is that, in fact, the JT model does very well in explaining the behavior of large class of such near extremal or extremal black holes if you are at small temperatures, so the departure from extremality is small, or if you are probing them at low frequencies. Uh, and that will become clear as we go ahead. So I'll begin with an introduction and uh, then tell you about the thermodynamics um, and uh, more about the low frequency response of these black holes when you probe them and tell you how this is well accounted for uh, by the JT model and then end with some concluding comments. Uh, the work I'll tell you about has been done with various students at uh, the Tara Institute. Uh, Pranjal Nayak, Ashish Shukla, Ronak Soni, Vishal, Upman Yumaitra, and Sunil Sake, some of whom are now postdocs. And here are my three current students. Vishal will soon be a postdoc at the ICTS. Okay, extremal black holes, as you all know, has been a rich uh, subject of study in our field. Much of the success in state counting has been for extremal black holes, both supersymmetric and non-supersymmetric ones. Another interesting property that these black holes have is called the attractor mechanism, which is actually tied to the success in state counting. Uh, many of these extremal black holes have a near-horizon ADS2 geometry, and it turns out that moduli, which might take varying values at infinity, get drawn to fixed values at the horizon, determined entirely by the charges carried by the black hole. So the horizon acts like an attractor. And uh, then, similarly, the radius of the ADS2 is also then determined entirely by the charges. Uh, this is analogous to what happens in flux compactifications. The electric and magnetic charges of the black hole give rise to fluxes at the horizon, and uh, those fluxes generate a potential that fixes the moduli and determines the radius of ADS2. Uh, and you can understand, this was first uh, understood for supersymmetric black holes, uh, but then found to be true more generally in non-supersymmetric ones as well. And the phenomena can be understood on the basis of an effective potential or as uh, explained by Ashok very elegantly, by extremizing an entropy function. Okay, so here, and it works both for uh, non-rotating, spherically symmetric, and rotating black holes as well. Here is, for example, the near horizon metric of the extremal curve black hole in four dimensions. If I give you a little, a moment or two to think about it, this is an ADS2 factor, except it's really a warped ADS2, because the, the overall factor in front varies with the angular directions. And what's interesting is that the whole metric can be obtained uh, by extremizing the and a suitable entropy function. The radius of the ADS2 depends on the angular momentum carried by the black hole. Now, what about going beyond extremality? Here, the situation for black holes, unlike more extended black brains, has been less clear. For black brains, of course, we know at small temperatures or low frequencies, the response can be understood as arising from the near horizon, higher dimensional ADS region, ADS3 or higher. And this is, of course, gives rise to the celebrated ADS-CFT correspondence. But for black holes, the situation has not been as well understood. It has been known for some time that some deviations from the attractor solution must be included when we uh, include non-extremality or uh, throw in some probes carrying energy, but exactly how to do that has not been very clear. Physically, we know that we have to include the deviations uh, for the following reason. The internal volume transfers to the, 
two-dimensional ADS space is fixed by the attractor mechanism to finite size. And that means once you introduce any additional energy, there simply isn't enough space for it to dissipate in. Even in 1 plus 1D electromagnetism, we know if you introduce a charge, the potential grows linearly in response to that. In ADS space, two-dimensional ADS space, the radial direction is even more finite. It's like a box, and so the back reaction just blows up in response to any additional energy. But what was not clear is how to incorporate the deviations from the horizon geometry in a systematic way to understand the leading response. Now, here, progress came in a very beautiful paper of Maldasena, Stanford, and Yang, building on much earlier work in the JT model. And here are only some partial references. I'm sorry, I'm not including more of them here. What they showed was, in the JT model, uh, as you know, and I'll review it briefly, there's an additional field, the dilaton. That dilaton, what uh, MSY showed, was once it's allowed to deviate from its value at the horizon, then leads to the back reaction being controlled. Um, they were, of course, motivated by a study of this SYK model and so on, and there's been a lot of work on that. Now, so the physical argument I was giving you why the back reaction blows up also suggests that we need to include deviations of the internal volume from the attractor value. But what happens in the higher dimensional context is that many other components of the metric also deviate from their attractor values at the same order. And in fact, the internal volumes variation away from the attractor sources these other deviations as well. So it's not clear how to control then the resulting uh, dynamics in the system. Um, and uh, what we in fact found was, and this is the uh, sort of bottom line I'd like to go towards, is that in fact, quite interestingly, it's really the departure of the internal volume which is most important. The other changes are in fact, in a sense, subdominant in a very precise sense as long as we work at low temperatures and low frequencies. Okay, here's a brief review of the MS, of the, sorry, Jacob Teitel Boehm model. We've uh, looked at it many times in this uh, conference. There's the bulk term. I'm dropping the topological piece here. So there's the bulk term, there's the dilaton and two-dimensional uh, metric, uh, and there's a boundary term which is important, which includes a Gibbons Hawking-like contribution, as well as an additional piece which is a counter term needed to get finite results uh, once one does holographic renormalization. And when one matches to the higher dimensional system, the dilaton should be really thought of as being the analog of the volume of internal space, and I'll be coming back to this as we go along. Okay, now this has a solution which is ADS2 with the dilaton varying. The horizon here, the Poincare horizon is as Z goes to infinity, the dilaton goes to zero, that is the analog of its attractor value, but you allow it to vary. The variation of the dilaton breaks the SL2R symmetry of ADS2, and is that breaking is characterized by a scale J, which will be very important as we go along. Uh, uh, the dilaton blows up as you go towards Z equals zero, and you therefore need a boundary to define the model properly. And we'll take boundary condition, the boundary to be located at a fixed value of the dilaton phi b so that it satisfies Dirichlet boundary conditions. So the model then is characterized by three parameters, the two-dimensional Newton's constant, j the scale or breaking of conformal invariance due to the rolling dilaton and the radius of ADS2. Okay, now what, what was found was that there's a really very elegant description of the dynamics of the system. Let t denote Poincare time and u be the proper time then really the dynamics arose because of fluctuations of the boundary, and those fluctuations gave rise to, give rise to an action which involves the Schwarzian derivative of time reparameterizations uh, with a prefactor that involves one over j, the scale of breaking, and the two-dimensional Newton constant. And this then action can correctly reproduce the behavior of black holes in the bulk. For example, you can take a black hole in the 2D uh, in, in two-dimensional anti-resetter space, and its entropy comes out correctly uh, from this Schwarzschild action. It's linear in T. To make up the dimensions, you have one po power of J in the denominator and G tilde. Similarly, if you have a probe, say scalar, 
with some mass, this would be its anomalous dimension in ADS2, and you want to compute its uh, response, the response of the system, say a four-point function, you can write, expand it out like this. This is four powers of the scalar, which can be thought of as a source in the one-dimensional boundary theory, and this is a coefficient function, which can be thought of as a correlation function. Then that correlation function goes like one power, now of the breaking scale in the numerator, and suitable powers of omega to make up the dimensions. If you didn't have the breaking, then you would, uh, it would go like omega to one additional power from dimensional analysis. So you see that in fact, because of the breaking, the response is enhanced by a, power, by a factor of j over omega. And if you took j to go to infinity so that the rolling of the dilaton is suppressed, goes to zero, then the back reaction you see here blows up. That's the old problem I mentioned. Okay, uh, and our, what, I, what our analysis shows, uh, this is the central result, is that the JT model with a suitable identification of parameters is in fact a very good approximation for a wide class, to very good approximation to describe the behavior of a wide class of extremal and near extremal black holes in higher dimensions, as long as we are at small temperatures so that T over J is very much smaller than one, and small frequencies so that omega over J is much smaller than one. We have shown this for spherically symmetric black holes, like say extremal or near extremal rise new Nordstrom black holes, by studying both the thermodynamics and the response to probes, and also shown it to be true for the thermodynamics of rotating black holes. We are still studying the response to probes for the rotating case. Okay, I'll give you some um, of the key points here in the, in the analysis, but before that, let me say uh, that the dilaton, which arises in the JT model, as I said, is related to the volume of the internal space. So to be more precise, if you take a spherically symmetric case where phi is the radius of the uh, sphere, uh, and you write it in terms of its attractor value phi naught like this, then little phi, the deviation from the attractor, plays the role of the dilaton in the JT model. Okay, now a key point as I was mentioning is that there are many other fields, for example, components of the metric besides the dilaton, which also deviate from their attractor values at the same order in one over J. Um, and these deviations are not captured by the JT model. However, it turns out that these deviations lead to subleading contributions to the, at low temperatures and low frequencies. Uh, in powers of T over J or omega over J, and therefore they can be neglected. And I'll give you an example of that. For example, um, if you work in the spherically symmetric case, you can do a dimensional reduction to two dimensions. At the quadratic level then, what you get is the action of the JT model in the bulk shown here, but in addition you have a quadratic term in the dilaton, phi squared. And what that quadratic term does is if you now look at the equation for phi, it doesn't just impose the condition that r equals minus two over L2 square as it would do in the JT model, but gives rise to a correction due to this term, which causes the curvature to depart from a constant value. However, those departures contribute in a subleading way, for example, to the free energy. And an easy way to see that is the following. The dilaton goes like one over Jz, as I said. So if you, if you consider the effect of this term, since it has two powers of phi, it would go like one over J square. And that means, say, in the free energy or entropy, the leading contribution this makes goes like one over J square, which is suppressed compared to the leading contribution, uh, which goes like one power of one over J. And this is uh, what happens for other fields as well that their contributions are subleading uh, for related reasons. Uh, it's important when we use the JT model for these higher dimensional situations to locate the boundary of the uh, ADS2 region in an appropriate uh, region. And it has to be located in what I'm calling the asymptotic ADS2 region. And this can be understood as follows. If you go sufficiently far from the horizon, the effects of temperature, for example, die out in a near extremal uh, black hole. But you don't want to go very far away in locating the boundary of the ADS2 region because then corrections from the ADS2, because the geometry ultimately glues in to a geometry that is, say, asymptotically flat or asymptotically ADS, those corrections uh, kick in. Those corrections are characterized by a scale 
usually related to J. So you want to locate this boundary then uh, roughly in that intermediate region where the temperature has effects have died out, but the corrections have not become significant, driving the ADS2 geometry to the asymptotically flat or ADS case. As long as you do that and you locate the boundary at a constant value of dilaton, then you capture the behavior of these higher dimensional systems very well from the JT model after identifying parameters suitably. So the final conclusion is therefore really very simple and elegant. On physics grounds, we expected the deviations in the volume of the internal space to be important to allow the black back reaction to be tamed. And in fact, this turns out to be the only deviation we really need to include to leading order. Other corrections are not as important. And the JT model, of course, keeps track of this de deviation via the dilaton, and it therefore describes universally then uh, extremal and near extremal black holes with a near horizon ADS2 at low temperatures and low frequencies. More checks are needed in the rotating case, as I said, for the response to probes, but I think within this framework that should work out, um, although we are trying to do that. Okay, in the time that remains, let me just give you a, a little more of an idea of how the analysis goes by considering the thermodynamics. So we take an extremal uh, black hole and we heat it up a little bit and when you do that, the metric changes. Let G bar be the metric of the extremal black hole and delta G mu nu be the change in the metric because of having uh, turned on a temperature. And we are interested in finding, say, the free energy which arises from the on-shell action to leading order then in the temperature. Now, in the far region that I was describing, the region away from uh, where you've located the boundary of the uh, ADS2 region, the, the, the far region which connects to the asymptotic flat or ADS space, uh, the correction due to the finite temperature is small because the effects of the temperature have died out. Since um, the extremal metric itself is a solution to the equations of motion and the act action is extremized by the solution, therefore, the first order variation due to delta G mu nu from the far region then uh, vanishes. Um, that only leaves the near region, and in the near region, then the corrections arise from the JT model to leading order, the extra subleading terms, the extra terms which are present giving subleading effects uh, due to the kind of reasoning I mentioned with the phi square term. Now, to be a little more precise, actually, uh, what, there are a few, few caveats. Here I've shown the full on-shell action by breaking it up as an integral from the horizon to the boundary of ADS2 and from the boundary of ADS2 to infinity. And uh, I've, uh, the dot, dot, dots are additional terms, for example, gauge fields, et cetera, which are present. And what I've done is added and subtracted appropriate boundary terms, the, four di the higher dimensional Gibbons Hawking term, uh, for example, at the boundary of the ADS2. These terms are, of course, not present to begin with uh, because there is no real boundary uh, at the boundary of ADS2. We have just created it for ease of calculation, but you can always add and subtract this contribution. It won't change the final answer. Then it's with the, in the presence of this boundary term that the action is actually an extremum uh, on shell, and therefore that the far region contribution vanishes. And it's precisely in the presence of this boundary term with the appropriate sign that the near, near region uh, expression reduces to what you get in the JT model with its boundary terms. So that's how the agreement arises in a very nice way. Okay, and this is, that argument is very general. It just arises for, uh, from the fact that the on-shell action is being extremized. It's true in the rotating case as well. And uh, in fact, um, you, we have checked very explicitly in many uh, four and five dimensional rotating cases, including the four dimensional curved black hole, that you get an agreement in say the free energy or the entropy between the JT model and the thermodynamics of these near extremal black holes. Once you identify the parameters appropriately, the two dimensional Newton constant in the JT model is identified, is related to the higher dimensional Newton constant using the volume of the uh, internal space at the horizon. 
this is the standard way you would do it if you were, for example, doing a Kaluza-Klein compactification. Um, and J is obtained just by looking at the leading deviation of the internal volume from the attractor. And once you do that, you get a perfect agreement with um, the higher dimensional thermodynamics. Okay, a little bit about the low frequency response. Um, this we have done for non-rotating cases so far. Um, it's useful to carry out the response for non-rotating black holes so far. Useful to, uh, to discuss this by breaking up the analysis into different partial waves. Um, and it turns out, for example, if you're computing a four-point function, that the dominant contribution comes due to S-channel exchange. Now, it might seem strange at first that there should be a S-wave uh, sector uh, in gravity, uh, which is a spin-to field. Uh, but in fact, there are S-wave contributions which arise and which are the analog of Coulomb effects in electromagnetism. And in fact, it's exactly these effects which are described by the Schwarzschild action, and they end up dominating at low energies. You can check this by, for example, in the asymptotic ADS-4 case, directly computing a four-point function using the standard rules of ADS-CFT at the ADS-4 screen, and then take its low energy limit and you get an answer which exactly agrees with the Schwarzschild action. Again, once you identify terms in the JT model, the uh, various parameters of the JT model with the higher dimensional system, like I was doing for the thermodynamics. Now, higher partial waves can be present and they will also contribute, uh, but their uh, contribution is suppressed, you can show at low energies. Uh, cumulatively though, you can have many partial waves if you have a big internal volume. So um, you can have many of them, and cumulatively, their effect can be significant. But the nice thing is that to uh, get these contributions due to the higher partial waves, the breaking of conformal invariance is not important. Uh, that is subdominant. So that can be incorporated using the standard rules of uh, ADS-CFT in ADS-2, and is straightforward to calculate. Um, and physically, this is because the, when you come to the higher partial waves, their effects when averaged over the internal sphere cancel out as far as the back reaction is concerned. So the back reaction for the higher partial waves is controlled even without letting the volume of the internal space grow. So you don't have to include that breaking effect and you can just work in ADS2 without any breaking. So for example, in a four point function, the S wave intermediate state gives a contribution enhanced by a power of J uh, compared to any single partial wave which has one power of omega more, four delta minus two instead of four delta minus three, and therefore uh, the S wave sector is uh, dominant. But of course, if you have many of these, then for intermediate energies, the higher partial waves will win out. Now there's one important comment, which is that if you have gauge fields, then there's a S wave exchange due to gauge fields, in this case, literally due to Coulomb effects, which are also important and which need to be incorporated. One can show that uh, such a gauge field in ADS2 gives rise, an U1 gauge field gives rise to a phase mode, which is an analog of the Schwarzschild mode. It's the simplest term you can write down involving the phase. And it also has in the prefactor one over J hat, which is a scale that breaks uh, the, the scale invariance of ADS2. And the difference is that J hat arises not due to the deviation always of the internal volume, but more generally due to the deviation of, of a scalar field, which determines the gauge coupling of the U1 field in the bulk. Uh, but again, once you know the profile of that scalar field, you can obtain J hat and obtain this phase action. And that needs to be incorporated along with the Schwarzschild to obtain the leading uh, result in terms of the response. And if it's a non-abelian factor uh, gauge field, then that can be suitably incorporated as well. These phase modes were seen in charged SYK models earlier, also seen in three-dimensional gravity in this work, and they actually arise very generally uh, just because of Coulomb effects um, due to gauge fields. Okay, so, um, so the final result for the low-frequency low response is also quite elegant. The S-wave sector dominates at low frequencies, and the JT model, along with extra phase modes, uh, incorporate the effects of this sector. Higher partial waves can be easily incorporated because doing so doesn't require us to include the breaking of conformal invariance. So we can compute these effects in standard ways uh, based on ADS-CFT. 
As I said, for the rotating case, we are still trying to work out the response uh, to low energy probes, and uh, so uh, th that, that's worth doing, and that will uh, complete the whole story. It will also be nice to connect to CAR CFT, and also some nice work by Alejandra Castro and collaborators on this subject. Okay, so let me then end by saying that the behavior of extremal and non-extremal black holes is correctly described, well described by the JT model at low temperatures and low frequencies. Leading corrections only require that the internal volume be allowed to vary uh, in response to uh, the changes in temperature or, or, or the probes that are sent in, and you have to include the phase modes. Uh, there are a few interesting open directions. Uh, our results suggest that uh, any microscopic theory uh, which has a gravity dual, uh, which is a extremal or near extremal black hole at low energy should give rise to a near CFT1, like in the SYK model, governed by a Schwarzschild action along with phase modes, except these will be unitary theories in general. And it'll be very interesting to check in explicit examples where, say, in ADS4 or uh, five or something, we know the microscopic field theory dual, uh, turn on appropriate charges, the gravity dual has an extremal geometry to check whether from the field theory side itself we can show that you get the Schwarzschild action, uh, etc. cetera. Um, another interesting question is we studied the low frequency res response in the probe approximation as I was describing, but it would be interesting to ask what happens if you have large amplitude, slowly varying situations. One might expect that there's a kind of membrane then, which is basically at the boundary of this ADS2 region, and that membrane interacts with the outside, and there's a fluid mechanics uh, description for that entire interaction, which should be valid on length scales where the fluid moves on, on some length scales which are much uh, more rapid than the temperature, which could be zero for the extremal case, but more more slowly varying than the chemical potential uh, or the scale J, which I was using before, which describes the breaking of conformal invariance. Well, this is a homework problem given to us by Professor Shiraz. We haven't solved it yet, uh, but I think it would be interesting to work out this kind of fluid mechanics. I'm done. And of course, it would be very interesting to see if the JT model then can be put to use in studying uh, near extremal curved black holes of the kind found in nature. The approximation that, uh, that we would be working with a slowly varying situation would mean one would work on time scales longer than the horizon light crossing time. For a solar mass black hole, that means frequencies smaller than 10 to the 5 hertz. But hopefully, that's still an interesting window. And if one can say something, I think that will be really very exciting. I end with this picture. This dot here is one of the uh, black holes known, seen in the Chandra Observatory, which is spinning close to extremality, wouldn't it be great if you can say something about such objects? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we may have time for one or two questions. Uh, it has been suggested that near ADS2 uh, regimes for uh, higher dimension black holes, there is unusual hydrodynamics. Are you saying that this can be computed from JT gravity? Yeah, I think there's a hope that we should be able to do it. Uh, it will be different from the usual hydrodynamics, but, um, you know, because so many of the details are unimportant and the JT model seems to work so well, I think it should be possible to, to understand that, but that's the kind of thing we are trying to do. I don't have a definite answer yet. Any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank Sandeep again. Thank you.